I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are... It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. A podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome! Welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Welcome to the 101st episode of It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. We have a wonderful interview with Donna's Casey, who wrote the book The Wrong Girl. Donna Casey is the author of 10 Alifair Tucker books. She has twice won the Arizona Book Award for her series, and she's been a finalist for the Willa Award and the Oklahoma Book Award. Her first novel, called The Old Buzzard Had It Coming, was named an Oklahoma Centennial Book. Donna is a former teacher, academic librarian, and entrepreneur. She was born and raised in Tulsa. Oklahoma and now lives in Tempe, Arizona with her husband, poet Donald Cooser. The book we will be talking about today is The Wrong Girl. Blanche Tucker longs to escape her drop-dead dull life in Boynton, Oklahoma. Then dashing Graham Payton roars into town, posing as a film producer. Graham convinces the ambitious but naive teenager to run away with him to a glamorous new life. Instead, Graham uses her as cruelly as a silent picture picture villain. Yet, by luck and by pluck, taking charge of her life, she makes it to Hollywood. Six years later, Blanche has transformed into celebrated Bianca LaBelle, the reclusive star of a series of adventure films, and Peyton's remains are discovered on a Santa Monica beach. Is there a connection? With all the twists and turns of a 1920s melodrama, the wrong girl follows the daring exploits of a girl who chases her dreams from a farm to old Hollywood while showing just how risky and rewarding it can be to go off script. We would like to introduce Donna Casey, who is the author of the book Wrong Girl. Welcome, Donna. Well, thank you so much for having me. Your Alifair Tucker series was based on real stories you gleaned from you and your husband's family history while researching your own family genealogy. Will you be able to include any real-life inspiration in your new Bianca Dangerous podcast? Hollywood mystery series. Oh, yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, what really happened at that particular time in Hollywood and also some of my own family history, because there was a real Bianca, there was a real Blanche, who was my great aunt, who actually did run away from home when she was quite young. The way she ended up was quite different than my Blanche did. I did base my character on my great aunt. She looks like her, and the runaway part was inspired by my actual great aunt. I just stuck her in what really was going on in Hollywood at the time. Gave her a much better ending than she really had. (laughs) (laughs) There were 10 Tucker children. What made Blanche stand out that you picked her to spin off? For this particular one? When I first started writing the Alifair series in 2005 is when the first one came out, my idea was to have one book for each child, each of the 10 children, because it was just going to have a finite series series with 10 books. And I thought that I would bring forth as the children grew up a different child for each book because that would give me different characters and they all interact with their mother differently and that sort of thing. It would give me a much broader group to work with. And I had done all the children but one when I reached the 10th book, as a matter of fact, but she's only seven years old at the time. So I'm thinking I'm reaching the 1920s by this time because the Alifair series went all the way through the 1910s. And finally, 
finally, in the last book, the 10th book, was in 1919, and I'd reached 1920, and I thought, well, you know what? The world has changed quite a bit. I had gotten the older children more or less settled. We knew what they were going to be doing with their lives, but the younger children were coming up in quite a different world than their older siblings. World War I was just over, and the United States was quite different. It's quite changed. I thought, well, you know, earlier on, I had sent Blanche, she was 10 years old, in my sixth Alifair book called The Wrong Hill to Die In. I had given her a lung disease and sent her out here from Oklahoma. I sent her to Tempe, Arizona. That particular book took place in Tempe, Arizona, which is where I live, because at the time my husband was having health problems and I thought it would be much easier to do my research here rather than do the long distance research in Oklahoma. She had already been out here to Tempe, Arizona. And when I was doing the research for writing that particular book, I discovered that in that year, 1916, well, at the end of 1915 and early 1916, they were actually shooting a movie here in Tempe. A Hollywood theater company had come out here to shoot a movie called The Yaki right in downtown Tempe, and it was being shot at the time that I was setting my book. So I set the story of that particular book around this movie that was being shot in Tempe, and Blanche was there. She was 10, and she was absolutely fascinated with the movie. And I had already in earlier books also mentioned that of all of Alifair's children, she was the most beautiful. She was astoundingly good looking, which really worried Alifair a lot because she thought she's just too good looking to be able to handle it. And in fact, she was right. Blanche is too good looking for her own good. But the fact that I had already set up Blanche as being particularly pretty, kind of louche, and I had already set up the fact that Blanche is quite fascinated with the movies, and I had had the story of my real great aunt Blanche who ran away from home. So I put the three together and created the story of the wrong girl who actually ran away from home. Like I said, she ended up in a better situation than the real Blanche. In your research of the silent film error, did you find any information about Hollywood that would surprise readers today? Well, it certainly surprised me. I think we all know that Hollywood is, I can use a Las Vegas term, is kind of sin city. In the 1910s, especially, and the early 1920s, Hollywood was very entrepreneurial. There were lots and lots of women writers and directors and people of color and producers. And there were like a hundred tiny little studios that were all making their own movies. And it was very wide open that anybody could go and just get into the movies at the time. As the 20s go on, then the studio system starts to come up. And the studios start taking control of everything. As I'm doing my research, I discover that as the 20s go along, the studios sort of become like they're worse than the mob. <laughs> they sort of become like the mafia, and they sort of take over the actors' lives. There's a lot more sexism, and there's an infinitely more racism than there was. They begin to do all kinds of weird things, like they create personas for their actors that have nothing to do with who they really are. And they even have homosexual actors marry each other so that they'll seem like they're pure. And <laughs> so they set up people's lives. They create people's lives for them. The whole Hollywood thing was just amazing. It just got worse and worse as time went on. And by the end of the 20s, which I've reached about 1926 with my books, it's really becoming like a mob town at the time. And that really kind of surprised me. And the act don't have nearly the control over their own lives as they did in the teens and the early 20s. In The Wrong Girl, the murder, was that based on a real crime or was that just creative license? It's not based on a real crime. It's based on a real event that inspired me. On February the 2nd, 1926, there was a giant storm off of the Pacific that washed away most of the pier, the Santa Monica Pier, and really eroded the beach, and that's where the Palisades cliffs are, and it had washed away a whole lot of the rubble at the bottom of the cliff. And I thought, well, gee, that would be a perfect place to expose a body that had been buried there for a while. And I thought, well, that's just a wonderful real event that I could use to find this body that had disappeared. There were plenty of murders I could have had <laughs> that particular time. There were plenty of murders going on in Hollywood at the time.
time. And I could have chosen one of those, but I needed for this person to have been buried for several years. I was just lucky that there was a storm at that particular time in Blaze. Wrong Girl, basically two stories. How difficult was it to keep the two storylines from crossing over each other? The reason this was two stories is it's kind of an origin story. This is kind of the introduction to what I hope will be a series or at least two or three books, at least a trilogy. I wanted to kind of segue from the first series into the second series with Bianca Dangerous and tell her story and how she got to be who she is. So I do have the two stories of when she was 15-year-old Blanche and how she became the movie star, Bianca D'Angerous. So I've got them cutting back and forth. I know the story in my head. I could keep the story apart without any trouble. But when you're actually writing it down, the trouble is you want to be sure that you don't give things away. So there was a lot of like building a house with Legos and making sure that the scene from the future didn't give away what had happened in the past too soon. I wanted the whole story to build and to come together in the end. But you know, that's fun. If I weren't facing a deadline, it would have been a lot more fun to try and get it worked out. You know, mystery readers are very sophisticated. They know all your tricks, so they can read your signals. It's always really interesting to try and fool people who know all your tricks. I love to be fooled when I read a mystery, and to try and do it myself is just really a lot of fun. Well, you did a very good job. Well, thank you. That's nice to hear. In the future books, they'll mostly just take place in the late 20s with very little going back because we've already established her story and how she got to be. We liked Detective Oliver that was prominently portrayed in the book. Does he appear in the next Bianca novel? He does, yes, but not until about halfway through. You know, it's interesting because I've been kind of surprised. I've had a lot of reaction about Oliver. People really like him. He's kind of between a rock and hard place, basically. I could really hear his voice when I wrote the book, and so he really came to life. But yes, he appears about halfway through the second book because it deals with the death of Rudolph Valentino which took place in New York. And Oliver is in California. Bianca can travel back and forth, but Oliver doesn't have the money. (laughs) So they end up going back. The mystery is basically solved in California. I'm very intrigued by that because I think that that was a very interesting story with Rudy Valentino. Are you going to include any other scandals like Fatty Arbuckle or any of the other scandalous things that were going on back then? Well, I'm certainly going to use some of the ideas of things that happened, but it depends on when. Now, if I use the actual event, the Fatty Arbuckle thing occurred earlier. There was another quite famous murder that occurred in 1921. A director named William Desmond Taylor. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, who was shot to death by, they thought, Mabel Normand and Mary Miles Mintner were considered suspects. They were the last ones to see him alive. There was so much information on that particular murder that occurred in 1921. There were diagrams and all sorts of things. And I actually used his house. And that's the place that Graham lived in, the house that he lived in that she burgled. That is William Desmond Taylor's house because I have so much information on what it looked like and where it was and what kind of people lived there. I kind of mentioned that murder glancingly, but it isn't actually about the murder, but it is that particular place where that murder took place. So yes, as I do my research, I always find things that give me ideas that they're just too good to ignore. I'm kind of interested in things that took place in the 30s, 40s, and 50s as well. So I won't be able to use those actual things because I kind of want to stay in the late 1920s. But I may fictionalize some actual things, like murder of Johnny Stompanato, and (laughs) there are all kinds of interesting things that went on at the time. Yeah, Yeah, that's one nice thing also about writing mysteries and about anything about murder is sometimes you just really don't have to make things up. What really happened is just infinitely more exciting than anything that you could make up. Ruth is stranger than fiction. No kidding. (laughs) And the death of Valentino, doing the research on that just gave me tremendous amounts of material because even at the time, there were so many conspiracy theories about what really happened to him because he died so suddenly and he was so young. You're still talking about it today. 
Oh, yes, absolutely. There are groups of people. You can look up online and there are chat rooms and everything of people about the death of Valentino. It's really you interesting. Murdered. <laughs> well, I made that determination in my book, whether he was murdered or well, not. I can't wait to oh, read that. I can't wait to read that one. Yeah. <laughs> How many silent films did you have to watch while researching the Hollywood silent era? Well, I started or before I even had the idea for exactly what I was going to do with the book, because like I said, I'd reached the end of the teens in that 10th book, Alifair book. And I thought, well, I'm gonna, what was going on in the 20s? So the first thing I always do when I'm writing any kind of historical, since I write historicals that are set in the early 20th century, is I can read the newspapers. And if it's set in a time when there was movies, I'll watch movies and then see what was going on. Well, I started watching silent movies just to see what the 20s looked like, what people were wearing and what hairstyles were like and things like that. It just suddenly dawned on me that this would be a great way to set up a 